Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for that wonderful introduction. Nice house tonight. Wow. It's cold out there, but we're going to warm you up. <laughs> Ladies, it's so good to see you here in Chicago, converging together all at the same time, which, as I understand, has been a little bit of an unusual event lately. <laughs> well, we all live in different parts of the country, but nowhere better than Chicago. I know you, I know you were right going to say that. that. <laughs> I now, live here. Very proud of it. And, and we're on the south side of Chicago, and you know that is the best side of Chicago. Did you know that? That's what I hear. And it's, it's so funny because I've done, you know, I've done these things for the Humanities Festival and other groups over the years, and there's always a little green room, and you hang out in the back there while you're waiting for the program to start, and usually you're chit-chatting, having coffee, you know, catching up with your voice messages. Back there, they were working it. For the last half hour, 45 minutes, you were recording promos for Supermajority. Seven or eight of them you did. We got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do, Laura. Yeah. We being, interviewed, being interviewed by Mick Challenge, the two young ladies from Mick Challenge did a great job. So you make every minute count. We really do. But that was really fun. Thank you. That was dope. Thanks for interviewing us. We learned a lot. That's right. The young people can teach us many things. All the things. So, um, super majority. Uh, one of the things that one of the young ladies asked was, she took my question away, and it's like, you know, come on. <laughs> you so let smart. young people in, I know. And they take over. <laughs> and that question was, you know, how, and I know you're going to talk a little bit more about super majority, what you're doing right now, but how do each of you personally come to this moment where you find yourself working together as a, as a very diverse trio on a, on a really unprecedented movement? Uh, I'll start with you, Cecile. How did you get to, what's your personal moment or your personal journey that got you to here to, to the supermajority? So uh, I've been an organizer. I've been very fortunate to be an organizer my whole life. Grew up in Texas where my parents were against everything. So we just learned how to organize at an early age. Um, but I, you know that can be. Uh, but I, I spent the last 12 years um, at Planned Parenthood and I had this experience after the last election where I, I don't care whether I was on the subway, on the street, that there was somebody who would come up to me, a woman, always, almost always, and say, what am I supposed to do now? And there was just this incredible feeling of, and of course, we saw the women's march, the largest marches in the history, recorded history of the United States, right, including here in Chicago. Including, we were one of the biggest ones here. Exactly, Chicago. exactly. And it just seemed like this moment um, that we really needed to figure out how to answer that question. That I think women who had been marching, they'd go into the town hall meetings, they were um, organizing around family separation, they were organizing to defend Planned Parenthood access, which we did in fact, and if I could just point out, it was women who defended the ACA and Planned Parenthood. Um, despite the fact that the president and the speaker of the house at the time, Paul Ryan, who is now retired, uh, wanted to shut us down. Planned Parenthood's doors are still open, and that's because women organized in this country. And I think that's, that, yeah, exactly, we can give it up for that. But it was this idea that, wow, if we could connect some of the best women organizers in the country and take over, how awesome would that be? And, uh, take over the country we're talking about. Exactly right, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> and anyway, but I mean, not to make, a, um, make light of it, but I, Jen and I had worked together before. I knew Alicia more by reputation and just being such an incredible organizer. And so we decided, wow, what if we joined forces and then added millions more women to the cause? And we could not only, I think there was a, obviously there's a real focus on 2020. Women are the majority of voters. You know, we can, I'm sure we'll talk about that tonight. But I think we're, our aspirations are higher than simply changing who's in the White House. It's saying, like, actually, what would, a, what would this country look like if women were actually, and all people were actually really equal, and really there was gender equality? And that's our North Star, and like, how do we actually imagine that world and go build it? And that's really what Supermajority is trying to do. Cool. Alicia, what, what about you? You've done so many things, and you've been an activist since a very young age. Yes. What brought you to this stage tonight? In, ter in terms of, it, was there a personal moment or a personal yeah. recognition or that, or was it just who you are, <laughs> or both? <laughs> well, maybe it's both, I don't know. Um, well, I was saying that I too have been involved since I was 12 
And I grew up with a single mom who um, didn't expect to have me by herself and really had to figure it out. And to figure it out, she had to work a lot of jobs. And I, when I was in middle school, there was a big fight happening in my middle school about allowing access to contraception through school nurses' offices. And I thought that was ludicrous that there would be any kind of uproar because frankly, everybody was talking about how they wanted to prevent teen pregnancy, but nobody was talking about how to make sure that people had access to the things that we needed in order to make decisions that were best for us. And so I got involved in that. And I had a mother who talked to me a lot about how hard it was uh, to raise me on her own and how hard it was to be a woman in the workplace um, and all of the things that she had to do to put food on the table. And I didn't tell this story backstage, but I will say that my favorite memories of my mother, and she passed away last year, but my favorite memories of my mother are waking up in the middle of the night and I would see a light on in the kitchen and I would walk towards that light and there my mom would be at this little table by the window and that was her time to be alone, right? And when it was her time to be alone, she was either, you know, watching her show, she loved a law and order, <laughs> she knew every character, but she was also, I could tell, like trying to figure out how to make everything work. There'd be receipts everywhere and bills and coupons and all the things and I just, viscerally have this feeling like there are so many women out in the world that are doing just that, staying up in the middle of the night trying to figure out when everybody else is asleep, how do I pursue my own dreams and how do I make it work? And I'm committed to building the kind of country where um, women don't have to stay up at night trying to figure out how to make it work. And also where little girls like me that are paddling towards the kitchen with the light on, um, know that we're gonna be okay and know that we're gonna be able to um, make decisions over our own lives on our own terms. So I started out with reproductive justice and reproductive rights, and now I'm working for the rights of everybody to live as full and dignified human beings and to be able to decide what happens to ourselves and the people that we love. And it's interesting, you, you said that you thought you were, you, you were gonna be an architect when you grew I, up and- I really wanted to be an architect. But you are in many ways, but you're not yeah. building buildings, but you're building- I'm not building buildings, but I'm building movements mm -hmm. and that's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jen. Um, well, a moment that came to mind when you posed the question and I was as, as I was listening to my sisters is, um, you know, we've been, I've been organizing with domestic workers for 21 years now. Um, the nannies and the house cleaners and the home care workers who work in our homes, they take care of some of the most precious aspects of our lives. And yet, uh, some, the, some of the most undervalued and invisible work in our entire economy. Um, and it's also the industry where we have the largest concentration of undocumented uh, immigrants in any industry working. And so when we elected a president in November of 2016 who ran on bragging about harassing um, and assaulting women, uh, ran on targeting immigrants, um, I was absolutely devastated. Um, that day, election day 2016, and the day after election day, we held an open call for our membership um, where hundreds of domestic workers got on the phone together just to talk about how we felt, just to be together in that moment. And I really didn't know what to expect. Um, you know, I think I expected there to be a lot of fear um, and a lot of sadness and devastation. I, I don't know. I just didn't know what I was, what to expect. And we got on that call and two things happened. One was that one person after person talked about um, how we need to be there for each other and support each other. And encouraged each other. We, everybody offered words of encouragement and support and reminders that none of us were alone, that we were gonna get through this together. 
And then the other thing that happened was person after person said, what's the plan? What are we going to do? We're ready to fight. We have to fight. We have no choice. So what are we going to do? And between the power of that sense of community and a reminder that we're not alone, right? That we are together and we're going to get through this together. And the readiness the day after the election to organize and to move into action was all I needed to know, OK, how do we expand the circle? How do we make this community as big and bold and powerful as possible? And that's what we're trying to do. Expanding the circle. So could will you talk a little bit more about what does that mean in, in real terms? I know you just, we were talking backstage, you just did a, a big, I think you called it a wild a bus tour this uh, a few weeks ago. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about what that was about and what is your strategy, what is your organizing strategy and where do you want to be in November of 2020? Oh, you're yeah. getting to the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, I want to be celebrating in November of 2020, I'll be honest. Uh, so it's a modest goal, but uh, one that I think is achievable. Um, and I do think, look, all of us are seeing women want a lot of things, and I think they want information that they can trust. I think we're living in a world where it's very hard, and a lot of women come to us and just say, "Just tell me what's happening and what I can can do about it." Um, they do want to. They do want actually training about how to get involved, and this is really fascinating to me. We actually, when we first launched Supermajority back in the end of April, we had like 200,000 people just like sign up immediately, and 70% um, of them said they had not been politically active before. And so to me, there is this, some of us have been doing this forever. We don't know what else to do with ourselves. But there are a lot of folks uh, of all generations that are saying, actually put me in. I don't know, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I just need a little bit of encouragement. Um, and then of course we've seen too that all across the country, I, I remember I was in, I was in Ohio, um, it was after the last election, I was out there campaigning for a senator and every single town in Ohio had a new women's group. You know, it was like the badass babes of Bay City and the like red, wine, and blue in Cincinnati. And I thought, okay, this is great, but what if we could actually pull all of this together and so that the women who were in Dayton, Ohio could talk to the women who were in Chicago, Illinois, and the women who were Tulsa, Oklahoma, and my home state of Texas, and actually all of us kind of get in formation, and then you actually could have a really powerful movement. And not simply to vote, although we do have the ambition collectively of running the largest woman-to-woman -woman voter turnout program next fall that we've ever seen in the history of this country, wow. and that will make a difference. But, but also recognizing um, to what end. And I think this is something that we all talk about a lot, which is a lot of folks have been, I, I'll just be honest, I think a lot of women, and most importantly, and most specifically women of color, have been the foot soldiers of the Democratic Party for their entire lives. And it's about time that the issues that women and women of color care about go to the front of the agenda. And I think Thank that's- Thank you very much for that. That's, I mean, that is just a, um, I think that's a big part, and so actually, and maybe iGen or uh, Alicia might want to talk about this, but part of our bus tour was actually engaging candidates and letting candidates hear from women instead of women hearing from candidates. You're talking primarily about presidential candidates? We had, yes, we had presidential candidates sit in rooms, listen to women, um, and out of that, you know, came um, what we call our majority rules of what women really need um, to, to be able to live in a country where they actually have rights, have the opportunity to live their dreams, as, as, uh, as iGen said. And so that is, I guess, our first conceit this year, I hope, is that to give women the, the, the community, the training, the support, um, and know their power, because women actually will determine the future of this country politically, and it's about time we know that and demand something in return. Mm -hmm. Did, Amen. Did you want to add? Well, <clears throat> I think there's like a big elephant in the room, which is how do we not repeat what happened in 2016? And there's a lot of talk, right, about how white ladies voted for white supremacy as opposed to fighting for each other and fighting to make a better life for all of us. And 
I know I came out of 2016 really feeling like, really? Like that's what we're doing right now? There's all kind of analysis we can do about, you know, who were those white ladies? We know a lot of it was evangelical women. Um, but we also know, right, that there is a real fear of change in this country. Demographics are changing in the United States and a lot of people are wondering what happens when um, this country is majority people of color, but majority people who have been marginalized. And I think what we found is that um, rather than it being like white ladies don't want to be involved in a multiracial effort, what we are finding is that actually um, people really want to figure out how do we come back together as a nation. And I, I know Cecile and I were in Detroit together and we had a panel of local organizers who really talked with us about how it is that they build movement across identity, across gender, across sexuality. And you know, one of the things that we talked about was like, what are the hard parts of coming together and working together? And a lot of it was like, how do we navigate the fact that we've been kept apart from each other for so long and we've been told all of these messages about each other and how we're taking things from each other as opposed to people taking stuff from all of us. And you know, after that panel, interestingly, there were white ladies sitting in one corner and then there was women of color sitting in the other corner and it's like black ladies over here, right? Everybody was in their groups. And I can tell you after that panel, everybody got up, the white ladies in particular got up and said, okay, we can start right now, right? So just went to go get to know other people in the room. And I wonder, for me, like what that sparked was, you know, if we can actually keep inspiring that kind of spirit where, you know, we're not gonna solve every problem just by like integrating a room. But what we can do is start to break down some of the barriers between us that actually um, keep us from being powerful together. And I think supermajority is really trying to figure out how do we build the kind of multiracial movement that we need in order to build the multiracial democracy that we all deserve. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of old white dudes running everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm really tired, I'm really, really tired of rich people mm. um, telling stories about us to us about why they should keep their money and why yeah. we shouldn't have any, right? Absolutely. And I'm really, really tired. <laughs> I'm really, a, really tired. You got a tired. long list here. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> Christmas is coming, so let me roll out the list. I'm really, really tired of the people who are rigging the economy and democracy literally getting away with murder. So. Um, to me, supermajority is a really interesting place to experiment with how do we stick it to them? And I think the way that we stick it to them is by getting people together, and women in particular, who have everything to gain from breaking down those barriers that somebody else built between us and saying we're not gonna fall for it anymore. And just to build off of that, I, one of the things that we've been doing a lot from the beginning, even before we launched Supermajority, is doing a lot of listening to women in different communities, and from Alabama to Ohio to um, Colorado, every rural, rural, urban, suburban communities, we've been listening. And, and we think that's, a, that's really important because the power of this movement is going to be really honoring all the different experiences. Women are not a monolith by any stretch of the imagination. And being able to honor all of those different experiences and tapping into that wisdom and insight and experience to build a powerful movement is going to be essential. And then the other thing we really found is that we actually share so much in terms of values. We did our own poll where 70,000 women responded to this poll we did about priorities, values, what do we care about, what do we want to see in the future. We did research where we oversampled for groups that are underrepresented in every aspect of our lives so that we could really understand what was going on and what people thought and felt. And at the end of the day, we share so many values 
across all of our different experiences, the notion that we should all be able to live and work in safe environments, that our work should be valued and seen and honored by this, valued in this economy, that our government should represent us, right? These are core unifying majoritarian values that are under threat right now. They're under a direct attack. But if we all share them, we absolutely have the power to transform this country and make that our future, have those values shape our future. And having that conversation, that's what the majority rules is. The majority rules are an articulation of what we heard from all of the people we talked to about the values that we share. And we've been going out with these rules as a tool to organize and build power, and it has been so powerful because everyone has a story about each of the different values, and we learn about each other that way, and we're able to build off of all of our differences around what we share. I, can I say something just sure. to that? Because I think she, this is really, it's such an interesting moment, because it's not just this political moment which we're all trying to live through um, and survive, but actually what's happening is that women who have been in isolation, either, um, for whatever reason, are realizing, actually, it's not them, it's the system. And so when you have rooms of women uh, realizing, well, the fact that they, they're trying to take care of their parents and get affordable childcare and hold down two jobs, it's not a question of work-life balance. It's a question of the fact that the whole system is rigged against women being able to actually um, be successful. And I think there is enormous relief and community that's being built when women just go, wow, but what if we actually, what if affordable childcare was a national imperative? And not just for the women running for president, but everybody running for president, right? What if these are the things that are actually um, the everyday lived experiences of women became the agenda. Um, and I, I feel like that is what we are hearing. And I think the relief and excitement that women feel and, and, and the joy that women are taking and the success of other women these days, it's infectious. The, it's the, 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 what's been happening in Congress in terms of the rise of women in power in Congress is one example of that. It's, it's women realizing that it's not them, it's the system, but isn't it also women realizing it's not the other women, it's not the women of color, it's not the immigrants, it's not the people that are taking things away from us or hurting us. Yeah. That, is that part of this conversation too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, and, I mean, I'll just real quick, we, we started, actually we kicked off our bus tour uh, in Atlanta, Georgia with Stacey Abrams, who we all know when, when Stacey, yeah, let's, when Stacey Abrams won the primary and became the nominee for governor of Georgia, it was like the shot that went around the world. I just like women who'd never even been to Georgia were excited about Stacey Abrams. And I feel like that's the kind of, that's what we're seeing everywhere is women being so proud of, of women who are just not waiting their turn, not asking for permission uh, and getting out there and leading. And, and that's what I, yes, and I think, you know, at the local level, at the national level, I mean, the fact that you have, yes, record numbers of women, record numbers of women of color in Congress, it's, um, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I just, I think women want to rematch. I think we really feel like, you know what, um, we're not going through that again. And frankly, I know I wake up every day mad. Just mad. Like I wake up, I turn on the TV, I'm watching CNN, I'm mad, right? And then I'm like going through my life and I'm mad. And I'm like, I don't want to be mad, I want to be powerful. And that's what I hear from every single woman that I talk to, whether it's on the bus tour or the trainings we've done all over the country. People are like, I'm pissed. I'm pissed that the dude next to me who I've worked with for 10 years, I just found out he's making a lot more money than me and we're doing the exact same thing. I'm pissed off because I have a president um, who is talking about going around grabbing women by the genitals and that he could literally shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and nobody would do anything about it. I want to do something about it. And actually, I don't want the story um, that gets told about this moment 10 years from now to be 
We let it happen. I want a rematch, and this time we're going to win. I do. Yes, we are. And you know it feels amazing? Winning. <laughs> feels, it's our self-care. It's so good. Winning it's is our yeah, self-care. You know what self-care is? Winning. <laughs> That's right. And I'll tell you what, this weekend, or last weekend, we were door knocking in Virginia, and give it up for the Commonwealth. Yes. Talk about a super majority. Ooh. <laughs> That, see, that's winning. It feels good. It's excellent. And, um, and I was door knocking with a candidate for the House of Delegates who came to this, this country at six months old. Her parents were refugees. And she came in a boat when she was six months old. And, um, and I thought to myself, you know what? The best thing we can do under administ an administration that is spending every waking hour targeting refugees, targeting people, parents, who have risked everything to arrive at our border for the chance at giving their kids a safe future. And he is targeting them. The most satisfying thing is being able to elect their daughter to the House of Delegates in Virginia and then flip the house. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it was, it really was so incredibly satisfying. She won, Kathy Tran. Yeah. <laughs> hey, congrats. So I hear, I hear a lot of talk up here about power and building power and organizing power and gaining power. Uh, power has always been seen as sort of this masculine man thing that's, yeah. you know, the fist in the air. Yeah you know, r running the world, uh, the corporate yeah. executives that tell you what to do and tell you what you should think. Mm -hmm. You're not talking, what kind of power are you talking about? How would you define, that's the theme of this, of this festival, how would you define the kind of power that you're looking for in building? And is it different and how is it different? I'm obsessed with power. <laughs> obsessed. And the way you described it is actually, it's right. I mean, the way that power has functioned in this country has been aggressive. It's been parasitic, and it has been um, toxic. But I don't think that that's how power has to function. The first step to transforming that, I think, is really getting clear about what power is and what it is not. A lot of times people say to me, um, I have power because I woke up this morning and I feel great. I, I feel like I'm powerful. It's like, sure, that's empowerment. And when I walk out of my door, I'm still feeling fine, but then there's the world that I'm dealing with, right? Whether it be, I mean, my job is awesome. <laughs> but for a lot of people, when you leave your house, if you're lucky enough to have one, right, there are all of these ways in which power is shaping your life. Whether it be going to the polls and trying to cast a vote and being told that you've been kicked off the rolls. Um, whether it be going into a job and um, you look at your paycheck and it's 50% less than what you were told it was going to be because people can do that. Um, whether it be your workplace telling you that you can't unionize, right, because you're in a state that gives you the right to work, right? Um, that's how power functions right now and that's different. Empowerment doesn't change that. I think what does change that is bringing people together, understanding who's making the decisions over the stories that we tell about who we are and who we can be. Make America Great Again is a story that's built by people in power. Um, power is definitely about deciding where resources go and where they don't go um, and why, right? Power is 100% about um, being able to determine who represents you right, and what they do with that, with that decision making. I think the way that we build power is bringing people together under a clear vision, knowing the things that get in the way of us advancing that vision, and I think power is about taking over the mechanisms where decisions are being made and resources are being distributed. But to be honest, it's not enough for us to just put women in power. Right? It's not enough for us to put women in decision-making uh, 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 
uh, places of decision making if the decisions that they're making are not under the values that bring us all into a better state of life. So what we're doing at Supermajority is not just trying to change who's in the White House or not just trying to, you know, kick racists out of the White House or people who, you know, grab people's genitalia. We are actually trying to change how power operates, which means let's get clear about what are the values that unite us all and what are the values we should be making decisions with. If we're saying that our bodies must be safe, right, then that means that when we're making choices about where resources go, that resources have to go towards initiatives and programs and all kinds of things that actually keep our bodies safe. Um, if we're not figuring out how to transform the way that power operates, we've actually just replaced one bad uh, set of actors with another. Um, so I think what we're concerned about at Supermajority as it relates to power is how do we put more women in control of the decisions that impact our lives and how do we change the way that decisions are being made in the first place so that we're never back in this situation four years from now, eight years from now, 12 years from now, et cetera? Well, you know, that's so inspiring and so right on. But I guess some people might feel like if we could just get that guy out of the White House, we'd be somewhere. Is, I mean, what you're talking about is much bigger, much loftier. Do we need to take baby steps and just focus on getting the guy out before we... need we... to do both because okay. it's bigger than the guy in the White House. And even if we get rid of him, there's still the disease, right? The disease that is greed, the disease that is letting people live without the things that they need and not be able to make the decisions over their own lives for their families and for the people that they care about and for ourselves. So the guy in the White House is a part of it, but honestly, we're gonna be spending another 10 years undoing the damage that he's done. But I think it's actually, and yes, and, and, and absolutely changing who's in the White House is going to be a really important thing to um, achieve. Um, but I think one of the things that to me is exciting about this moment with women is that, um, well, things weren't that great for women before this president, okay? So a lot of the things we're talking about. Sexual assault being rampant in this country, uh, women losing, uh, uh, women not even having things, basic things like healthcare access, maternity benefits. I mean, I can't wait for a world in which actually employers don't see uh, maternity care as a nuisance, but rather a vital thing for basically half the workforce in America. These are, these are institutional things, and, and, and when I talked about barriers before, so I think we are, are at, the exciting thing to me is we can have aspirations higher than simply changing something in one election, but actually saying these are the things that we need to make a, to make a country that's truly equal, and really shoot for that, shoot for the big stuff. Um, because I, look, we've been making incremental change our entire lives, and I think women are finally saying, actually, if we all got together, we could demand and, 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 and get more. Um, and not to be powerful over other people, but just, just simply say, it's time, actually, for it to be equal. And mm -hmm. I think that time has come. Uh, women are now almost half the workforce. We're more than half the college students. We're more than half the law students. We just had an all-women spacewalk, for God's sake, right? I mean, there is like, change is coming, and I think it's really exciting to think that we can do this across race, across issue, um, and, I don't know, build the future we want to live in. Well, and, and part of what you're, I think you're trying to do is, and you just cited those statistics, is educate people about how much power women already have. Thank you. And where we've already come from. Which is where, where you come, come in. I mean. As a reporter, you mean. <laughs> I, exactly. Yes. The exciting thing is more women are reporters now, and they're finally telling the stories of women and women of color. And you that, be, you to be, me, you meet those big bad fake news media people. Yeah. <laughs> it's really exciting. Thank you. Aja? Well, I think one thing that um, that we do have to shift is the idea. I think we put too much power in the hands of people like Trump in a way. In that, in that. Democracy itself, I think the biggest lesson out of 2016 is if we don't participate, if we don't show up, bad things happen. And we risk losing democracy itself, really. Um, there's a baseline of engagement that we all have to have 
And we just have to keep raising it because I think what we learned is that it's actually not a given. And, um, and when we do participate, amazing things are possible. Amazing things are possible. And that is the, that is the promise of this moment in that I think if this, even though we're facing unprecedented attacks and threats, we are also seeing unprecedented levels of activism and engagement, and that is the path to the future we deserve in this country. And it's not like we reach a benchmark and then we all get to go home and chill. It's actually an ongoing engagement that we have to have. And the more we raise and broaden and deepen that level of engagement, the better our prospects are for the future. And so I think it's like we need to, yes, think about who we're electing and what that looks like and how to win in that context. But we also have to understand that, um, that at the end of the day, it is really about us and what we do and the choice to keep doing it over and over again. Well, yeah. I mean, Alicia and I have been to Detroit more times than I can count now. And I mean, it's just because it's such a fascinating state. But just, I also think we have to give people the tools to know that actually they can make a difference. And so it's something I'm obsessed with is the last presidential election was really decided by three states. Um, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Michigan was decided by 11,000 votes. Um, there are one million unregistered women just in the state of Michigan and 170,000 women of color unregistered. So just wrap your head around that. So if women actually, if we register our voters, if we talk to each other, if we work together in community, we can comp completely change, um, I think, the political future. And, and, and that to me is empowering. So you're registering voters and you're organizing voters and you're bringing uh, some of the presidential candidates to women to let, so that they can listen and hear their views. Are you, do you plan to endorse in the presidential race? What is going to be your, your role in helping the country decide on our next, theoretically, our next president? And does it matter if it's a woman in the White House or not to you as an organization or personally? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say this. Yeah, I don't know. Right. I'm not speaking for supermajority. I'm just speaking for Cecile. There better be a woman on the Democratic ticket for president or vice president. I'm just saying that for whoever's listening out there, I mean, um, it's just, we're overdue. Any woman. Any I mean, you, we, well, we, I don't were, like, I mean, we were I, talking before about some women aren't necessarily. For women. The, yeah, that's right. right. That's right. No, I just think it's really important that the Democratic Party recognize yeah. the role, I mean, just that we're never going to have equity until women are represented at the highest levels, and they have never been before. Mm -hmm. And and I just like, you look at, right now I feel like, and this is again, this is speaking for myself, I feel like Nancy Pelosi, that one woman, is like the one thing almost standing between us and like, you know, a total, cal thank you, calamities. calamities, exactly. So if we just had a few more women, right, like maybe we could actually fix stuff again. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I want women to run the world, like officially. I mean, we're like already doing that, but officially. Um, we're powering the world. You know, we're yeah. not running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. They're great point, great distinction. I think our best contribution in this moment um, is re-engaging people in democracy. And what we hear all over the country actually is not, um, you know, will you guys throw in for Amy Klobuchar or will you stand for Kamala Harris? Like, nobody says that to us. Um, what people say to us is, um, I really want to learn how to do more. I feel like I'm not doing enough and I want to do more. So, sure, uh, I, you know, I take people to the polls, but I think I could be you know, getting more of my neighbors involved. Um, what people say to us is, you know, what I'm noticing is that this group that I've been working with, um, this group I pulled together, 
we all look the same. And we know that um, we're not reflective of what our community looks like and we wanna fix that, but we just don't know how. Can you help us think that through? That's what people are saying to us. They wanna know how do we get involved, stay involved, and actually make the change that we have been fighting for for so long. What I hear from women all the time is, I thought we got farther than this. I thought we got farther than this. And I don't think people feel like 2016 was an anomaly. I think people feel like it's all hands on deck and I'm raising my hand to do more and I'll get everybody I can to do more, but help us think about what that looks like. Help train us. How do I build a phone network? How do I uh, poll watch? How do I make sure that um, that my neighbors know what their rights are when they go to the polls. That's what we're hearing. So it's you not say they, they, endorsement they, they, stuff. They feel like they haven't gotten, they, we, we, should, we haven't gotten farther than this. Do you think people feel like they've regressed? Or, yes. Or, or the, their communities have regressed and, yes. and, this, and this started before Trump? Yes. I think I, we hear that mm -hmm. things have regressed. And I think for some of us, peop, we say, um, I don't, I'm tired of this. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of this. So if we haven't gone backwards, why haven't we made more progress, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Although, and just to pick up on that, Alicia, I think too, our own polling showed that, and I think this is consistent with other folks and the women that we've heard from, is that women actually think they're losing their rights in this country. Mm -hmm. They are, they, even if they can't say exactly what is, they just have a feeling yep that they're losing their rights and they could actually be living in a country where their government tells them what they can and cannot do. And that is something I don't think we've ever seen before. And there's good reason. I don't think it's because they're delusional. I think it's because they are seeing a government that is actually stripping away rights that, I mean, to your point, mm -hmm. folks felt like we'd settled a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of what we're going to do, Cecile already mentioned this, but we are going to stand up, we're going to train hopefully <coughs> two million women who will mobilize millions more through the largest woman-to-woman -woman voter contact program in the history of this country. <laughs> and that means that we're going to need everyone in this room to sign up. Well, I was going to ask you about that. What do you need? But, but, yeah. but, but before we go, before, before we leave this, so are you not going to endorse in the presidential race? Is that, is that something is you haven't so decided very good journalist. I think, so I think we're going to, I think, I mean, I'll just say, I yeah. think that we, we don't, haven't really decided yet on endorsement strategy, but I can, I can commit to this, I think, or we can commit to this, is we are going to absolutely spend the next 12 months making sure that everyone who goes to the polls knows the difference between the candidates that are running for president on where they stand on the basic issues that women care about. Okay. And whether the most effective way to do that is endorsement or whether the most effective way is actually just shine a big light on that. Because, okay. um, you know, it's interesting. We, we just finished this big poll and half the women in this country, well, two thirds of women in this country say we're going in the wrong direction, including overwhelming number of independent women. And half the women in this country say they've economically are worse off than they were two years ago. These, it is important that we actually are talking to women consistently, you know, not just two weeks before the election, but over the next 12 months um, about how things could be different and where the candidates stand. And, and I just think from a, from, a, from a gendered lens, I don't think we've done enough of that in this country, and I think women are eager for it or hungry for it. So what is your decision-making process? Uh, whether you're gonna decide to endorse, how you're gonna roll out your strategy. Do you have a board or yep. a council or how does it work? Yep, we have a board, we got a lot of smart organizers and we got a steering committee. So, I mean, it's something we're gonna kind of wrestle through um, and we do on, on, on everything. Um, and we have I an online, we have a membership of more than 200,000 uh, women and men 30% of our members are people who don't identify as women. Um, and we're constantly polling people about um, what they care about, what they wanna do, 
and um, and it's fascinating actually. We're getting so much good insight, um, and we we did these uh, the the membership form. If you go online and fill it out, we ask questions like, um, "What is your superpower?" And this is one of the early moments where I really felt like maybe we're onto something here. Um, because one of the top answers, maybe the number one answer, was empathy. And that just made me feel like, OK, maybe we can actually do this. So the can, question was. Can I was, shout out somebody on that? Sure. Because actually, the young woman who did that, designed that poll, I think her name's Lizzie Chan, and I think her parents are here tonight. So I just want to give Lizzie credit to Lizzie amazing. for should be the so most proud. amazing research. Oh, anyway, are you here? Oh, hi. hi. Thank you. She's a genius. She's the best. <laughs> this is the truth. Did, Alicia, did you want to say something? Yeah, oh. I do. <laughs> I can tell. You're so good. You were like, so are you going to answer this question or not? <laughs> um, here's the thing. What we know is that no matter what, um, the people who we elect into office need to be following our lead, not vice versa. And I think what's really clear and wrong with politics right now, besides all the money that flows through it, um, is that we're kind of evaluating leaders based on whether or not we'd have them over for dinner, as opposed to I where they- with them. Yeah, <laughs> as opposed to what they're going to do to move our agenda on our behalf. That's why we elect them. And so I just want to like re-solidify that point that a lot of the reason that we're not focused on like, let's just like move an endorsement is because there's so much work that is needed besides saying you should all go vote for this one person. No, you should, you should evaluate, right? And push them. What are you really saying about how you're going to move money to the things I care about? What are you really saying about what you're going to do to make sure that I even get to participate in these decisions? How many times are you going to come to my community and keep talking to me and the people that I care about about what's happening and what needs to be done about it and listen to us about what needs to be done about it? Part of what this project is doing is trying to transform how politics functions. And, you know, again, I agree with Cecile. I don't want to rule out anything that is going to help us move the things that we want to move. But I do want us to be really clear that, like, part of transforming power in this country is about changing the way that we do politics. Mm -hmm. And if we really want to make sure that we're all in the mix, making decisions about what they're debating on the floor of Congress, then we've got to build that into the programs that we are doing outside of the congressional halls. So I just want to like keep pushing that point that it's actually not about them. It's about us, mm -hmm. and it's about the power that we can wield to reshape how decisions are being made about our lives. And in some ways, if you, if you were to do an endorsement of, of, of a presidential candidate or any other candidates, does that, do you maybe fall into the trap of then you're, you're, you're in their, you're, you fall in, into their system, you're going to have to play their game, and that takes you away from the strategy that you're describing. Oh. 100%. 100%. <laughs> Sounds like there's some more discussions to, to happen of, among you and among the other leaders of this organization. More to, more to come. I, I think, I mean, I do think it's to partly to what Elisa said is, is that um, it is about more than the election. It's about what is the agenda? What is, what is it that women want and need in this country? And how does that flip? I remember, mm -hmm. actually, I, Jen, and I were at a meeting with women in Congress because you know, there's like more women in Congress than ever before, and so they were having the, their first meeting, and it was like in this dingy basement with like takeout food, it, but, but it was like, but they were all there, and it was felt so, you know, women who'd been in Congress a long time, and then women like Lauren Underwood, who had just shown up, you know, it was like so exciting, yeah, exactly, it was just so awesome, and, you know, we were, we were getting to sit there with them, and they were strategizing, and, and uh, one woman from Congress, uh, from, from Florida, who's actually been there a, a long time, you know, she said, you know, it's, it's interesting, all the men in Congress, they agree with all these things we're talking about, but somehow 
when it comes to governing and appropriating, it's always about roads and bridges. It's never about, you know, getting affordable child care. Exactly. So she, it was sort of like this light bulb moment. So I think it, I think election, this election has to be about more than simply a win-loss ratio. It's about what, it, what do we actually want to see from our government. Okay, we just have uh, three minutes before we want to go to questions with the audience. And I, I hate to give this short shrift, but maybe we can talk about it more later. Young people, uh, teens, girls, the, the two stellar young ladies we talked to backstage, yeah, where the, what's their role in this movement and how are you uplifting them and making sure they're part of the conversation? Ajen, you want to? You were I nodding. mean, we're, we're taking leadership. We want to take leadership from young women and we want to build an intentionally intergenerational movement. Um, we want to bring women together to be able to learn from each other as today's leaders, right? Alicia always names the fact that people always refer to young people as the leaders of the future, but no, they're actually leading us right now. They're, they're the present. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so to create intergenerational leadership models, intergenerational multiracial leadership models where young people can lead us and where we can actually link arms and be powerful together and draw upon the wisdom that comes through intergenerational work is what we're trying to do here. Can you give an example of that? How does that work? In, in well, I was actually life? just, I was just thinking of when we were in Detroit, I don't know if you all remember, but there was a young woman there named Brooke, um, she's 17 years old, so she's not eligible to vote yet, but she showed up with these hundreds of other women and, and she got up to speak and she basically said, I'm here today. I wanted to be in this meeting because I think it's important that young women and young women of color and young women from the inner cities are in the room where it happens, right? Or in the room where decisions are being made and the agenda is being set. And she said, the next, next November, I'm going to be old enough to vote. I'm going to cast my first vote for president. And I want it to mean something. And so I feel like partly it is making, those, making the space and encouraging young women who aren't even in the political process now um, to be in the room where decisions are made and, 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 uh, and hold the rest of us accountable. And with so many young women becoming voters, what's the number? What's the number? Yeah, you so this, I mean, this is another number I'm obsessed with, is that every year in this country, approximately 4 million people turn 18. So I'm not great at math, but that means approximately 16 million young people who couldn't vote in 2016 can vote next November, and we should be investing in all of them, right? right? Because that's the next way. That's right? a lot of people, and that's they can make the people. difference. That's a lot of people. This would be a great time, I think, to turn to you for questions. And I think we're going to bring up the, the lights. Crystal? Yeah, can we bring up the house lights, please? Oh, and Crystal's going to take over from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies. Oh, your mic is not on. I'm, I'm waiting for it. It's coming. Uh, so uh, I'll just speak loud. Maybe make sure that uh, you do speak into the microphone. Uh, please do keep your uh, questions brief and do pose them as questions uh, rather than statements. So uh, let's go ahead and start right over here. Hi, my name is Griffin Smith. Thank you. Uh, you are all very inspiring. Can you please speak about the Equal Rights Amendment? Could, do you have a specific question? I would just like to know what the recent election in Virginia, um, how you are feeling, and uh, how you think that this may allow um, for the 38th state to ratify. Yeah, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. And so, I mean, the list of things that, it, 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 we'll get back to that, but I mean, the list of things that are going to be able to be possible in Virginia now, and actually, I don't know if y'all know this, but if there is a woman elected speaker of the House of the Commonwealth of Virginia, it will be the first woman in 400 years, okay? So just wrap your head around that. Like, that is, I mean, it's about time. Um, yeah, I think, look, I think the Equal Rights Amendment and the idea of actually getting an amendment in the Constitution uh, is, personally, I think is incredibly important. I think it's an important organizing tool. Um, we know that there's a, I mean, there's a lot of work to do, even if Virginia passes it, because of you know how many years it's been. But I think that idea of enshrining 
you know, gender equality in the Constitution is so long overdue, and I do think we're at the, we are a supermajority now, and I think it's actually, I think it's really possible. And we've got another question right over here. Hello, my name is Gerardo. I'm with Mikva Challenge. Hey. Uh, and my question is, what are some steps you're taking to make spaces for young women to become included in these type of discussions? Well, we're trying to encourage people to be a part of supermajority. So I think, um, what feels really important to us is that we are building across age, across gender, across race, right? But really centering the values that we think bring us all together. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think we are also, as we said earlier, waiting to be led by young people, right? So I think we're already inspired by people like Greta and people like Emma and, you know, folk who are already out there saying gun safety now, right? Saying urgency around climate change. And so we're just moving in lockstep. So I think we're ready to bring more young people into supermajority and it's free to sign up, supermajority.com um, and tell us what your superpower is. And I think also we're really ready for there to be um, uh, groups of young people who are taking action through supermajority in their communities. This is a home for you as well. One interesting thing, this is sort of actually just a fact point that mm -hmm. I thought was really fascinating. To, so one of the things that through Lizzie, um, our brilliant um, digital um, leader, uh, and others is that we're actually trying to actually engage more women of all ages in how they feel about things and actually kind of I mean, that was why it was so incredible to do this poll that just 75,000 folks just like took. They just like filled out a 15 minute questionnaire. It was amazing. And the things we learned were, were so interesting. And this is now gonna be kind of an ongoing way of actually getting feedback um, on ideas. Um, it, but the, one of the, the most interesting thing that came out of this first round was we asked the question, and this is gonna get back to your point. We asked the question, when did you first realize that your gender um, was going to, you were going to be treated differently because of your gender. And half of the, half of these 75,000 respondents said before the age of 12. So the importance of actually engaging young, young people is to me even more important. And the, and the, the things that, that folks said were so, to me, were so poignant, like one that just actually taught me about what we need to be doing to actually pay attention to young girls. Um, someone wrote, it was, um, I, knew, I knew that I was going to be treated differently when my mom took us to um, get our underwear and my brother got superhero underwear and I got days of the week. <laughs> right? Right? So the message was, he gets to be a superhero and you better have on clean underwear every day, right? right. It's so interesting though, the things though that I think that we as a, as a culture um, you know, another, another woman wrote in, she said, I knew when, um, when my mom said to me, uh, she was going back to work and she said, you're going to have to now take care of your brother. And he was two years older than I was. And I realized that my life was changing, but his life wasn't. And so I just, I think the voices of young people and, uh, um, and particularly young girls, we have to we have to integrate this into everything we think about as as organizers because there's just um, it's still really hard. It's still really hard. We have a question down front. Hi, uh, my name is Lori. I um, actually just need some practical advice. Um, I find myself having conversations with men in my life who are generally progressive but seem pretty blind to gender being an issue. And we keep getting into debates of like, well, um, you know, isn't that identity politics and doesn't that take us away from focusing on the real enemy here, which is capitalism? And I'm like, yeah, I get it, but why can't we have two, three different ideas in our head at the same time? And so like, what, what is the balance of, of me, because when, when I have, I'm having that conversation, I'm clearly filled with rage. Um, 
what is the balance of me trying to have a calm conversation and say like, well, why do you think that? You know, like, here are my experience. And saying like, why don't you like go read something? Why don't you talk to the women in your life? Why don't you like educate yourself? Why is it my burden to educate you on how you're oppressing me? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So you're looking, you're looking for some advice on yeah, how, how to I deal with these guys. Conversation. How do I get them on board and see the bigger picture of, it can be intersectional conversation. I'm so glad you asked that, because I think, um, one, you're totally right, and that's so annoying. <laughs> we can walk and chew gum at the same time, and guess what? Capitalism does that too. Um, but also, I just want to affirm that it is enraging, right? I think there are a lot of people who actually feel that way, a lot, more than we'd like to admit. That in the drive to try and figure out what brings us together, people's impetus is to push to the side anything that actually highlights what's different about us. The, that's fair, but the problem with that is um, it doesn't really help us understand the world around us and why it works the way that it does. So the reality is um, our economy our economic system is shaped by gender and it's shaped by race and it couldn't actually function any other way, right? Um, so my advice would be three things. One, um, decide where you're putting your energy. For some, they really do wanna know. It is a real question. For others, um, they're pretty set. In, in how they feel about a thing. My mom used to always say to me, um, there is no point in arguing with people who are committed to misunderstanding you, <laughs> right? So there's that, figure out how to prioritize your time. I think the second thing though is that for the people who really do wanna have the conversation, um, those kinds of discussions take a lot of patience. Imagine if you can remember a time in your life when you thought the world worked one way um, and then you learned that it worked really differently, that is a shock to the system. And there are all kinds of ways that we hold on to the things that we believe so deeply because they do something for us, right? It's probably hard for your friend to um, acknowledge, right, that the way they thought the world worked um, actually hurts you. Yeah, that's what's underneath that. Um, so I would say like those conversations take time and patience and you don't have to do it all. For now, the internet is free. <laughs> and also you can enlist the help of your people. Third thing is um, offer some resources. So there's lots of things out there, right? That talk about um, why the economy is unfair, why we can't just fight the economy if we wanna get rid of sexism or racism or homophobia, right? Um, and, and frankly, I think there's a lot of resources out there that talk about what we gain, right? What we gain when we do learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time, right? Um, I would say probably your friend um, wants to figure out how to be a real friend to you and is really grappling with, what does it mean that um, actually the way I'm living my life every day might be making it so that you can't live your life the way that, that you need to in order to find your full dignity? That's what I got. Book it. <laughs> and we've got a question to your left and in the back. Hi, my name's Kathleen. Um, when we talk about women and our ability to realize our power to affect change, um, we tend to talk about it at the federal level, whether it's Congress or the executive branch. And I would love for you to speak to it as to the importance of our work together as a community on the state and local level as well. Yeah, I mean, 
What's the phrase, all politics are local? Mm -hmm. um, so many, there's so much at stake in local elections, local and uh, community level decisions. So much about how we live and work and care. So many of those decisions actually do happen at the local and state level. And I will also say that while our federal government is stuck, that states and municipalities are the, the laboratories where we can actually start to, to build the future that we want to see in the country as a whole. States and municipalities are the beacons of hope, right? You can do things here in Chicago. You can model what actually needs to become federal policy one day. Um, and you here in Chicago, we here in Chicago can make that decision. It's incredible, actually, that despite what's happening at the federal level, there's still so much room to make progress at the local and state level. And I'll just say that just last week, Philadelphia became the city to pass the most progressive domestic worker bill of rights in the country. The city council in Philadelphia voted unanimously to give 16,000 domestic workers portable paid time off. Mandatory portable paid time off, meaning paid time off even when you have lots of different clients, even when you move from client to client. It's incredible. It sets a precedent for all workers who work in non-traditional settings to be able to get benefits that used to only be available to people in traditional employment relationships. So that's the kind of thing that cities can do. And we have to hold that space of hope and progress through engaging in local and state level politics. Mm -hmm. That's a great and answer. We have time for, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. We've got time for just one last question. Let's go right over to Hallie. There's a question in the back. Hi, um, I'm here with my two other friends and we run a feminist club at our, fe at our high school. Yes! <laughs> Represent. Um, and we try to maintain a pretty nonpartisan environment so we can ensure maximum participation from all people. Um, but do you think it's possible to talk about feminist issues in our current climate and remain nonpartisan? <laughs> That's a great that was question. Excellent question. <laughs> I mean, I think it's so interesting that we have to even that I mean yeah. it's such a brilliant question because when did equal rights for women become a partisan issue? It's insane. And so and I actually so I think we too at Supermajority, Supermajority is a nonpartisan organization because if you actually believe that um, we should have the rights to live with free of sexual harassment and assault, we should have the right to be able to take care of our families, have access to health care, have access to equal pay, there's not a single partisan thing about any of those issues. And so I guess my advice to you as or young organizers, one is like bravo you, is don't allow these to be segregated off as partisan issues. Maintain, I mean, just, you, we have to continue to lift these up as super majoritarian issues, because they are. Um, and I feel like one of the things that is, and, and iGen talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think we are being fed this line that somehow this country is all divided and no one can agree on it. I actually think the things we're talking about the overwhelming majority of people in this country agree with, and we cannot allow this to become somehow, um, you know, separated out by political party because um, it's just it's just simply not not right. So, anyway, um, and yet the only other thing I want to say to, to kind of echo what Alicia said is sometimes too there's folks you just don't have to waste your time talking to. <laughs> Well, it's important that you are talking to, to us tonight, and one sentence from each one of you as we leave, what's the one thing, they, this audience needs some marching orders, what's the one thing that we should do going forward? Sign up for supermajority. Yeah. 
But what else? That one, one sentence each. Do more than you're doing now. It's going to feel better. You're going to make change in this country, and you're going to meet amazing people on the journey. Mm. Alicia. Make democracy a part of your everyday life. We cannot just sprint to uh, November 4th or 5th of this year and then say, whew, we did it, that's it. Actually, the real, real work begins the day after the election. Think about what you want to be able to tell your grandchildren about what you did to save our democracy and put this country back on track when they ask you which they will. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. What a thank for the wonderful conversation. Thank you for coming.